Hello, I was just going for a stroll out in the field today. It's rather nice calm weather, nice and sunny for a change. And I came across this strange looking thing here. Looks to me like somebody has set up a couple of S-Bus mixers. This wire I think is just for power between them from Big Bertha, kind of battery there. And we have over here four GPS's all blinking red in unison once per second that's the PPS um, value and I forget which is which oh I mean I don't know which is which but um, <laughs> this looks like BN 180 that is I think a uh, original like legit U-Blocks M7 that is a BN 220 and that is a BN 880 and they're all in pretty much the same place and I put them over there, I mean somebody probably put them over there because it's free from outside interference it's probably the guy that lives over there, I think he probably came out here and he said I'll put them a little bit away from the house so that they don't get interference from the roof and then he came down here and he said oh maybe the signals might bounce off the car so he thought why don't I just put them all the way out in the field, that's probably what happened that's how we ended up like this isn't it <laughs> So, yeah, this was originally just going to be a test of three GPSs, the uh, the three BN ones, um, because SBUS Bixer has three UART inputs, or inputs and outputs, uh, but then I realised that one of the UARTs has to be taken up by the logging, open log thingy there, so that meant that one SBUS mixer could only do two uh, GPSs, and I wanted to do a little bit more than that, and since I have more than one SBUS mixer and more than one of these open logs, Sitting, hand, sitting around handy, I thought I'd put another one over there as well so we can um, compare four GPS's all at once. What the hell? Okay, it's about six hours later now, well after sunset. It's very cold, my hands are getting quite nice and chilly. And the blinking lights are putting on a nice show. We couldn't see most of those lights uh, in the daytime, only some of them. But now we can see all of them quite clearly, it looks quite pretty. I put a little bit of plastic sheet over there just to try and keep the dew off them but rather annoyingly the dew seems to have gone on the underside there instead of on the top I'm not really sure how that works but also quite interestingly wherever the wherever there's anything there there's an empty patch with no dew around them so I don't think it's interfered with anything um, so being dark now it's probably a little bit easier for them to locate the satellites because I don't know if you've ever tried to look at satellites but uh, they're a lot easier to see at night at least they would be if there wasn't a full moon up there somewhere there it is and I was just looking at this before and a couple of hours ago I was out here I looked at the moon and it was a full bright full moon and now it is behaving very strangely that's not a cloud it almost looks like an eclipse did I just by chance happen to stumble out here in the middle of the night to find an eclipse not even knowing it was happening kind of looks like I did anyway, oh, it's cold, gotta go back inside well look at this, it was an eclipse and exactly at the time that I went outside to pick that stuff up right about that time what are the odds, eh? usually the way this works is I'm aware that something like this is coming up and somehow I still managed to miss it but this time it was the opposite, so that's nice before we take a look at the results, I'll just show you the configuration that was running on each of those SBUS mixers because it's pretty simple. This is the whole thing. We just have a handful of GPS nodes and we're using most of these, uh, lat, long, altitude and ground speed. We're using those to check how well this GPS is reporting the reality of this GPS actually not, not moving at all. So lat, long and altitude we're expecting not to change. Ground speed we're expecting to be zero the whole time. Um, num satellites just gives you an idea of how sensitive the receiver is and then I also have valid down here which is just for my peace of mind because when I'm doing a test like this and I go away and I leave something for hours it really sucks if you come back and you find that something wasn't working so I just made it turn on um, one LED here if the GPS had a valid fix just so I could you know see that everything was okay and then over here we have the same thing but this is running on UART 3 so this is a the different, uh, different GPS module and that's about it, although there are a couple of other things that you need to set up here 
um, you need to say that this UART should be a GPS, that one's a GPS. And then my logging thing was on the UART 2. Um, and we also need to say, we also need to say what kind of logging output we want, CSV or binary, use binary in this case. So there's one other thing that we need to do, and that's to say which nodes should be logged. So this doesn't, this logging output just selects what style of logging we want. And at the moment, the only way to decide which nodes should be logged are, uh, is this flags thing here. So some people commented in my last video, why don't I make a tutorial? Well, one reason is that nobody can get this system to try it out at the moment. I'm just kind of teasing you with uh, advanced knowledge of you know what's coming up in the future. Um, and the other th reason is because a lot of these things are going to be changing. And one thing, for example, I'll be changing is this. Uh, the way this works at the moment, this is a bit flag, so it's not actually, might look like I'm saying that the logging should go on UART 2, um, but it's actually a bit flag, so yeah, it's not very user friendly, so I want to do something about that in the future. Okay, let's have a look at the results for the first test, and I say first test because I did more tests after this because uh, the main reason was that the Neo 7M performed quite well despite having, as we can see here, less satellites to use than the other three modules did. And I think that's because it was only using the GPS network. It was not using the GLONASS network as well, which it looks like the other ones are. But despite that, it performed quite well. So I thought I should probably do another test and include some more of the Microblox modules like the M8N. And I have an M8P, so I tried that one as well. Um, anyway, let's look at the startup time. Um, within about half a minute, they all have some satellites. And then after about a minute or so, this is seconds at the bottom, after about a minute or so, they all have about as many satellites as they're going to get. This was not a cold start. This was after about 24 hours of not being used, so not really a warm start either. Probably a pretty typical case. And I'd, I'm not going to bother showing you any more graphs of this like startup time because it seems to me to be fairly irrelevant, even if it took like three minutes. Like it's not a big deal. You're probably going to be fiddling around preparing other things for the three minutes anyway. Now I did of course make a bunch of graphs showing the altitude change and speed change and lat long deviation and stuff. Um, but I'm not going to show you that for this first test. I'll show you that for the last test where I did six modules all together. Here's the average position for the whole six hours for each module. Uh, the one on the upper left here is the 7M. I think the label is obscured by the 881 for some reason. Um, but as you might expect, for a six hour average, they have converged quite nicely to... Uh, I've put a little distance measurement here. This is just over three meters for the longest distance between them. And that's pretty good. So you could draw a three meter circle and they'd all be within that circle. I think that's pretty good anyway. So as for the true position, it's a bit hard to figure out what that is without some more high spec equipment, I think. But I'm just going to take the average of those four averages as the the true location for the rest of the um, graphs and stuff. To get an idea of how the values were spread two dimensionally, I just used the spreadsheet scatter plot to graph the latitude versus the longitude like this and this gives you points and it's not very accurate or anything this cross in the middle here by the way is what i just was just mentioning about the <laughs> my so-called true lat long um, but this gives us an idea of the overall scope of this one uh this one being the bn220 and how far away each of the points was from what we're going to call the true location and if i do that for all of them we get kind of this sort of result here. Uh, so you can see only the 220 uh, sort of wandered away for quite a while. Or was it quite a while? See, that's, a, that's what we don't know from just looking at this one. So I decided to write a little program that would produce a bitmap that instead of just showing us that there was a point recorded here at some point, how many points were recorded here is what we really want to know. So here's the output from my program, and the red cross shows the position of the so-called true location. And the colors of these pixels here show us how many measurements were recorded for each point. Um, the reason that these are so stretched out, elongated like that was, I think it's because I'm down here at the bottom of the world, and the latitude and longitude not really making a square. So when you try and draw this as equidistant points on a regular grid, um, you get gaps. So I just filled in the gaps by making these larger to fit, uh, to cover up all the black. 
Um, so the meaning of these points is that where we see pure white, like here, this is the strongest or the most frequently reported point that's going to be pure white. And then it's going to fade away down to black where there was nothing, uh, like out here. Um, yeah, I think you get the idea. So that's a histogram, I think you would call this. So this gives us a much better picture of how accurately each module was reporting the location. Uh, in particular, we can see that the BN 180 was kind of all over the place. Uh, it doesn't really have a solid point in any one particular place that it's reporting. It's just sort of wandering quite a lot. Uh, contrast that with the 7M and the BN220, which are reporting quite confidently that this is the location that they think they're at. Only difference is that the 7M is closer to what we're calling the true location. At least this point is. Uh, it's also interesting to note that there's another point of fairly strong occurrence up here. And this shows up again and again. See, it's sort of happening in the BN880 as well. Um, yeah, in the BN220, although it has a strong point here, it's uh, a fair bit further away than all the other ones were on average to the true location. So after seeing these results, it made me wonder a couple of things. First thing was that, are these U-Blocks modules or microblocks? How should we say that? U-Blocks, microblocks? I don't know. I'll go with microblocks whenever I remember. Those modules, I'm thinking they may be a fair bit higher quality overall. Because remember, this is only dealing with 15 satellites. And the other three had like sort of 18, 19, 20, even more than 20 occasionally. Um, yeah, so I thought I'll do, I have to do some more tests with more microblocks modules. The other thing I noticed is that this BN220 is way off. Uh, well, it's not way off. It's like probably about three meters this is. Um, but this is the BN220 that I was using recently in my follow me test, which consistently seemed to be a little bit off from the position that the um, GPS on the car was reporting, which was this one, the BN880. So I looked at that module and it has a little bit of discoloration or corrosion, not really rust, but it's sort of going a little bit brown on top. So I thought first thing I'll do is do a test with that one versus a newer BN220. So that's um, what we're looking at here. This time the true location, I placed it on the fence post, which I can see on Google Maps. So this, that's what I'm calling the true location for this one. It's not the average of the total. That's why they're, even though there's only two of them, uh, they're offset. That's, that's why that is. But anyway, um, the one at the top seems to be less confident at least. I'm not sure if we can say that it's less accurate, but it's it's sort of wandering a bit more than the one at the bottom. Not sure if that really proves anything, but I decided to go with the new one for the rest of the tests. Okay, it's a couple of weeks later now, and I have not managed to do any more tests. The weather has not been very good, but the main reason was because I broke one of these open log SD card logging things, and I only had <coughs> three of those, and I would have needed three of them to do a six-way test for six GPSs, which is what we have set up here. And the reason is because I was using two of the UARTs on the SBUS mixer to read in a GPS signal, and then the third UART would write out the signal to the logging thing. But, um, as it happened, the next thing on my to-do list for SBUS mixer development was to make it so that the signal that's getting written out to this, uh, not, not the CSV signal, you can do CSV or binary, CSV wouldn't work, but if it's a binary signal that's being written out to this, I wanted to make it so that another SBUS mixer could read that in and make use of it. And the main motivation was so that two SBUS mixers could talk to each other over a, like a simple, cheapy, serial white, uh, radio connection like that. So I implemented that. And then I, I realized that since I can do that now, I don't really need three of these things. I only need one. So, let me explain what's going on here. Okay, I just powered everything up so we can see some lights. Uh, so what's happening here is we have kind of a daisy chain of information. And this is the beginning of the chain. And this one is taking its two GPS infos and sending that, which is uh, 10 floating point numbers, to the next one over the UART connection. And then this one's taking that 10 plus its own 10 and sending those 20 over this connect, uh, over this connection to that one. And then this one is the only one that needs to have a logging card, which is there. So it's writing uh, 30 floating point numbers once per second um, from all of the six GPSs to one card. 
and that makes things a whole lot easier for me to process the data later because it's all in one file and it's all collated the times are going to be exactly the same because each row of information is coming in from the same time point uh, so that's pretty cool I think and so these wires now previously this this wire was only carrying power to the next one but now it's carrying power and a UART signal well coming one way it's a UART signal and I also improved some of the feedback that I have here so I made it so that that blue light flashes when the just to make sure the program is running like it hasn't crashed um, and then I'm using the RGB LEDs there uh, LEDs 1 and 3 uh, will be purple if there's signal coming from the GPS and that's actually purple there the one on the right there we go let's blur it oh there you go now you can see it's purple <laughs> um, and then they'll go green when there's a valid GPS fix so the one on the right there has not had a GPS fix it looks like most of the other ones have actually uh, and then the LED in the middle will be green if there is a signal coming across this UART connection that I was just talking about that is uh, relatively new so like less than one second old so this one doesn't have it because this is the beginning of the chain uh, this is the second the second LED there that doesn't do it but this one and this one should have that middle LED showing green uh, this one's also purple on number three because that one does not have a fix that's the BN180 typically the slowest to get a fix we are indoors though so wouldn't be too surprising if none of them had a fix but anyway those feedbacks there uh, have been very helpful when you're running a long test like this just to make sure everything's working as you expect so I'm expecting to see all of these green like that when everything's okay and this is where the test is going to be running today just on the edge of this fence and I put the plastic cover over it I don't think it's going to rain but uh, if it does it should be okay for a little bit before I can come out here and rescue it I actually ran this here yesterday for 10 hours but unfortunately I think I might have bumped something when I put the plastic cover on because one of the UART connections, the first one in the daisy chain uh, seemed to stop working after about 10 minutes and I think that was when I came to put the plastic cover on so I also I didn't have my feedback lights there, the greens so we should have three greens there three greens there, the one in the middle is not very bright for some reason and over there we're expecting to see two greens and then we should also have blue flashing lights on each of them just to make sure everything's going and we also need to check on there for the flashing lights on the open log thing to make sure that's logging all looks good so I'm not sure how long I'll leave this today it's going to be dark in four hours and um, that's when it starts to get all wet underneath the plastic so might just run this for about four hours today Whoops, I was just editing the video and I realized that I completely forgot to mention anything about the two new modules that I added. So one is a legit Microblox M8N. Um, and this one over here, this is just the antenna actually. And that is for a M8P module over there. So that's the fancy one that can do RTK. But there's no RTK going on here at all for this test. And when I looked at the data sheet, the M8N and the M8P are pretty much the same if there's no RTK going on. So we could really consider this just a test or a comparison of how does an M8N do with a small antenna and how does it do with a large antenna. And we've got a ground plane on there as well just for extra <laughs> help. Um, so I'm not really considering this one to be part of the test as something that you would typically, typically put on an RC plane or a multi-rotor or something. Uh, I'm just throwing it in here to see how good we can, how good results we can get when we do have some serious or a little bit more serious equipment. Um, and also because when we put this into the average to find the so-called true location, um, we'll probably get a better number if we have this running as well. Uh, so just to give you an idea of how massive that antenna is, and I'm assuming that most of this is the actual antenna in here. I've never opened it up, but. Anyway, it's like four times the size of a BN220. And let's see the changes to the program that's running on those three SBUS mixers because I did quite a lot of work on the logging system to make it a little bit more user friendly. So instead of using that uh, like bit flag thing that I had before, uh, I decided to make it a little bit more visible what's going on. So we're actually 
outputting a value to a new node which is called log output and it's going to take a value from some input or other and then we just have fields one two and three this is the same as we have for the NRF24 outputs um, but when you get quite a lot of these we've already got 10 on this one so this is the beginning of the daisy chain the stuff at the bottom is just for uh, doing the LED status LED outputs um, <clears throat> yeah but when you have a whole bunch of these um, it's a little bit of a nuisance to make them on the receiving side because you need a log input node so I added this panel down here where we can uh, we can copy these names into a spreadsheet if we want to look at the CSV values later and we can also do copy input nodes to clipboard which lets us paste um, like that and so we have an output which is lat2 in field 6 and then one of these ones I pasted should have the same thing here uh, so lat2 in field 6 but this one's a log input uh, so you wouldn't paste it in here you would paste it in <coughs> excuse me the receiving side which is sketch 2 did I say sketch Ugh. too much Arduino anyway so this is what's running on the middle uh, of the daisy chain this stuff here is almost exactly the same except instead of starting from 1 we're now starting from 11 and 12 and so on and we have a bunch of log inputs that just get passed straight through like this so log input log output we don't do anything with it because all we wanted to do was pass this along so that at the end of the daisy chain it would get written to the um, the open log SD card thing now I'm not suggesting that this is something that people would do commonly um, but it was a really great way to stress test things and make sure that everything's working okay uh, so then on the, the last part of the daisy chain we have now we've got 20 of these and it looks a bit um, daunting maybe but keep in mind I didn't I didn't actually create these I copied most of them from what I was just showing you anyway that's the uh, the program that's running on those okay so here are the results for that six-way test and as you can see the M8P and the 7M are both only using the GPS network I think that's what that means because they don't really get more than about 15 or 16 satellites actually they don't even go above 15 except for right at the beginning there and then otherwise it's like 15 or more commonly about 13 or for the 7M we're averaging about 11 um, so it's quite impressive how well they're doing considering they have much less information to work with uh, next chart we have is altitude uh, so this is meters above sea level I think uh, so it's about 100 to 105 where I am um, not sure how accurate that is I think it should be a bit more than that really um, but these lines because they're sort of on top of each other they're kind of hard to see so what I did was I separated these vertically like that and the vertical scale here is still in meters but it's not it's not a meaningful number like that would be sea level and this would be 70 meters below sea, sea level so it's not it's not below sea level um, but it is still 10 meters so this gives us an idea of how good and bad each of these were at reporting a constant altitude so the real value of the altitude is not changing um, so when we see something like this which is the BN180 is the worst which is typically the case for most of the results actually uh, starting from there and then going up to the highest point I think is there that's about a 20 meter fluctuation oh this test was just under five hours by the way so four hours and 40 minutes or so so what we're looking at here is over the course of say two and a half hours it's probably gone 20 meters <clears throat> difference in altitude whereas the best result which is typically the M8P at the top here it's fluctuated a total of about maybe 10 meters from there to there it's doing a lot better anyway uh, so the colors I've tried to keep the colors the same for the rest of these results as we go through and I've put the three microbox modules at the top or first and then the Beishan ones after that uh, this is the standard deviation for the altitudes that we just saw so you can see <laughs> quite a difference between the the best and the worst so lower is better for this graph uh, moving on we have ground speed now this is another of those graphs where uh, they all sort of get drawn over the top of each other but rather than separating this which didn't really help much I thought I would just take the average of the speed across the whole test and look at that as a bar graph and this again is lower is better because the 
the true value is zero. So the closer that we get to zero, the better the result. And this is interesting in that the only one that seems to have done a really great job. Well, hang on, this is that's two centimeters, isn't it? Point zero two, yeah, two centimeters per second. That's pretty good. But this is yeah, it's a lot better. Anyway, they're 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 all performing quite well there. Um, now we have latitude fluctuation, and I have again separated this like that. And <clears throat> the units for this vertical axis, I think, would be hundred thousandths of a degree. But it's not really so important what the actual units are as the relative fluctuation between them. So again, the three Bayesian models uh, keep saying model models instead of modules. The three Bayesian modules are up and down quite a bit more than the microbox modules, the three at the top. And then we move on to longitude fluctuation. And this is way more stable. So if we if I just switch between latitude fluctuation and then longitude fluctuation, there's much less change in longitude. And I think this is probably just something to do with me being down here at the bottom of the world. And as you get lower and lower or at higher as well like if you get closer to the North Pole and closer to the South Pole the the size in meters of one degree of longitude gets smaller and smaller tapering down to nothing at the South Pole or the North Pole um, but the latitude degrees they just stay the same all the way down so it's probably something to do with that I think um, anyway there's, there's definitely much less fluctuation in longitude and here we have <coughs> oh, my voice is going we have the standard deviations of each of those latitude and longitude. Again, I've listed the microbox modules along the top and the Bayesian models along the bottom, and considerably better performance from the microbox modules. The one strange thing about this test is that the BN180 performed pretty good. Uh, at least it looks, you know, from this display, it looks quite good. I was expecting to look a bit more like that, and I checked and double checked and triple checked these numbers because I thought there's no way. There's no way it can look like that after having just seen that the standard deviation in lat long, it was very high. But <sighs> something weird going on here, I think. But anyway, assuming I have made a mistake, maybe this BN 180 was supposed to be here. It looks almost like the 880 and the 180 got swapped. But anyway, <laughs> as a as a showdown between the microbox and the and the Bayshan module, it looks like the microbox ones are winning handily in every case. So at first I was tempted to say that the microblocks modules perform significantly better than the Bayesian modules, but is it significant? Is it really? <laughs> because it depends on what you're using these for, but assuming you're using them like I am for planes and drones and things, the difference of a meter or two here and there really not that significant, is it? So let's instead say that they the microblocks modules perform measurably better than the Bayesian modules. So that's about it for this video and just to finish up with it I'll show you this animation that I made and this is the full five hours or so showing this is about a six by eight meter window here so it looks like they're moving around a lot but they're not really. Anyway so the, the biggest three takeaways for me from this experiment was that firstly the number of satellites is not everything because in all of these tests that I did the ones that performed best we're using the least number of satellites. So I don't necessarily think that, oh, I've got 25 satellites, that's great. Yeah, it might not really matter that much. Secondly, I was surprised at how well the Neo 7M did, despite being so-called previous generation hardware. Those things still work really well. Oh, I should have mentioned that that has an active antenna. Hmm, that probably helps a lot. But still, just because this is 7 instead of an 8, hey, don't throw it away. They still work just fine. And the last main thing that I learned from doing all this is that the BN180 is a pain in the butt. Um, apparently it does not remember any of the settings that you gave to it, for example what board rate it should use to output messages. So I've managed to get my SBus mixer to work around that and um, basically you just have to slow down a little bit when you're starting up at the beginning when you're telling it what to do. That was the main problem I had. But I do distinctly remember a couple of years ago trying to use one of these with ArduPilot and every once in a while it would work but then it wouldn't and it was just a real nuisance. And on top of that, it doesn't really perform as well as the others do anyway. And I think it might be a little bit cheaper, but it's only half a gram lighter. And it's only a tiny bit, like maybe two, two millimeters uh, smaller than the BN220. So I really just can't see any point for using the BN180 at all. 
I would just use a BN220 instead if you want to go cheap and light. Anyway, that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching. See you next time.